At last, Simon Hunt, welcome back. Thank you. You and I have been trying to get together for what seems like an eternity now. Uh, so many people have asked to hear from you again with all the stuff that's going on in China. So this is a very lucky opportunity. We've managed to fit this in at the last minute. So thanks so much for coming up. Oh, my pleasure. Now, a um, bunch of stuff I want to get into. Um, and I want to start with something that you don't normally talk about, and that's Japan. Because you sent me a report you wrote on Japan uh, a couple of months ago, and it was, it was really interesting to me. It was something that nobody else has been talking about, particularly about the yen and abonomics. Perhaps you could lay out the, the, the story of your visit to Tokyo recently. I had a number of interesting meetings, and in one of them with a guy that a good friend of mine said was an insider, after copious glasses of sake, he asked, how do you see the yen? So I said, goodness, how am I going to answer this without you know, causing issues? So I said, when you look around the world, you have huge problems, political problems, geopolitical problems, financial problems. And it's pretty clear that within a five-year period, the global financial system is going to implode. So against that sort of background, what do you do if you're a family owner and you've got money everywhere, you bring it home? So I said to him, what I sense is happening is Japan is re repatriating its financial assets. And therefore, against that background, you have to see a hardening yen. So if I were an investor, I would be buying the yen. His reply was, you are absolutely right, and I have a target of 90. So then I started, uh, in other discussions, thinking about what is Japan's future? And the first thing that came to mind, which was confirmed in a discussion I had in, in a ministry that is responsible for the mining and smelting sector, is that Japan is not going to be an exporting base. Japan has its industrial bases offshore. They can export from those and serve the domestic economies from there. So that means that a lot of the capacity you have in Japan, you're not going to need. And this fits a society where you are going to see uh, the demographics of those aged 65 and over going from currently around 25% to approximately one-third by 2030. So the whole structure has to change. You've got to service that sector and not everything else. And so I came back with the, with the view that, you, that Japan, Japan is no longer being run by the BOJ. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just one dollar, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. I came back with the, with the view that, you, that Japan, Japan is no longer being run by the BOJ. It's pretty clear that Karuda's wings have been clipped, that policy is coming out of the Ministry of Finance, which is really being influenced by corporate Japan. The decisions are being made by corporate Japan. So this has enormous implications. It implies also, and I can come on to that a bit later, that Japan is going to continue to run down its uh, American debt. 
they'll, they'll continue to sell treasuries. I uh, think so. Repatriate. Yeah, I mean, this, this, but this goes against. I know it does. No, 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 but just not consensus thinking. This is the first time anyone's talked about something to me that goes actively against central banks, which is interesting because that's a turning point I've been waiting for. But central banks have lost the plot. Well, central banks yes no. no longer con can control currencies. Well, yeah, look, I, I think you're close to being right. I don't think you're quite right yet, but I think that's exactly the point I'm getting to. I, at some point, that's going to happen. And I've been waiting for all kinds of signs that that is actually occurring. Because I think once that happens, we enter a whole new phase of this whole game that we're all playing. Um, and I think if corporate Japan is about to say, well, screw the Bank of Japan, we're going to go absolutely against their wishes, that could be a, a seminal moment in this whole charade. But that's exactly what happened in January. When the BOJ brought in negative interest rates, what happened to the yen? No, absolutely right. Yeah. But, 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 but it yeah. happened in Australia too. But the difference between 105 and 90 is enormous. Yeah. At 105, it can be seen as a, as a, as a cyclical correction in a, in a secular yen bear market. You can argue that the BOJ has still got control of it, but it's kind of, you can blame it on the dollar, let's say. You can blame the weakening dollar rather than the strengthening yen. If it goes to 90, yes, they have lost control at that point. I mean, that's, and that's a very dangerous place for the world to be in. Maybe it's not a dangerous place. Maybe it's actually, it's a good place. Well, ultimately, <laughs> yes. No, I, I think well, if central banks finally get taken out of this and we you know, allow markets to, to be free again, God forbid, Yes, but, but there will be incredible volatility at yeah, that absolutely. point where the, where the central banks are taken out of the game. But it's not just the BOJs, the PBOC too. The policy has been very clear for over a year that China is going to run down a steady, steady course its holdings of American debt. Yeah, we're, I mean, look, we're seeing that. The, the data yeah, is unequivocal. Yeah, 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 I know. We're absolutely yeah. seeing that. It hasn't seemed to matter yet simply because I think there's just a shortage of good collateral. So there are plenty of buyers of treasuries because they just want sure, the collateral. Sure. So, so far, you know, that's managed to happen without any great disruptions. But, but you know, this, this plays in again. You, you've been the guy who's been talking about the weak dollar, not the strong dollar. And we've had all these guys talking about the case for the strong dollar, which they make very eloquently. And all that time, you've been the guy saying, well, yeah, okay, but... The it's a question game. of timing, that's yeah, all. Yeah, absolutely right. So, so where are we in that, in that stage? <coughs> I, I, I think what, what's happening now, um, quite clearly, the American economy is soft and is incapable of absorbing any increase in the Fed funds rate. So why all the chatter from various members of, of the Fed that we're going to raise, raise rates? It's to defend the dollar. It's a dollar defense. Jackson Hole talking to my friends, it was clear the message that came out, it's defending the dollar because once the dollar starts to fall below say 94, 94 against the index, it's going to fall pretty rapidly. That from a geopolitical point of view, their game is over. Well, but, a, but a strong dollar hurts so many people. But uh, a strong dollar hurts so many other countries. Yes. But a weak dollar, you know, ideally, I guess it's the other way around, right where it is, yeah. So, so what exactly are they trying to achieve? Trying to hold it dead uh, steady? Hold, hold it in this trading range. I mean, look, we all know well, that's impossible. 90, 93 to 98 or whatever is the figure. But I mean, that's, I know, I know. I mean, you, can, you can engineer a stronger dollar, you can engineer a weaker dollar, you can't engineer a stable dollar. No, I agree. So I, I think we have a strong dollar for the next few probably through to the end of October. And then I think the dollar starts a big fall, which fits into our inflation syndrome, uh, which, will, which will also include a bull market in commodities. Well, let's get on to inflation deflation. Is that something you spend a lot of time looking at and writing about and talking about? Um, and you've been, again, a, a, a not a lone voice this time, but, but, a, but a noticeable voice saying, watch out for inflation in this clearly heavily deflationary environment. 
What are you seeing there as you look for the turn from deflationary pressure to inflationary pressure? Well, first of all, I think you're seeing it in the financial markets. You're seeing it in the bond market. Yeah. Uh, that's point one. Um, point two, um, you're starting to see it in commodities at the margin. Um, I suspect that commodity, particularly the base metals that China imports in size, are being held down deliberately because the government is probably going to have to stockpile quite strongly and is currently completing contracts. So you keep the price down until they're all concluded. So you ask me, why do I say that? Uh, I believe that the State Reserve Bureau has actually received massive funding earlier this year. Why? To buy. Otherwise, they wouldn't receive it. It's government. So why would China stockpile important imported commodities, taking copper as an example? One, the banks are up to their ears in impaired loans. So to lift it will help the banks, lift prices will help the banks. Uh, secondly, um, dollar diversification. Thirdly, and I think probably the most important uh, point, security. Uh, China is a planned economy. If you're a planner, you have plan B. Sure. And plan B, relations between America and China are pretty awful at the moment and risk getting much worse and uh, therefore you have to plan that America in a fit of anger can shut down one or more of the sea route choke points so you need your stockpiles. So, so where are we now in the, the, the China, Russia, Turkey, you know, that, that axis What's happening there? Because you, you spent a lot of time looking and talking about the dynamics between those countries as they kind of coalesce to try and... Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's obvious that the relationship between China and Russia is a very strong strategic one. It covers trade, economy, politics, every, military too. Um, everything. And that's a complete change from 10, 15 years ago. Turkey is interesting and I think the jury is out. But I suspect, because I think America is trying to unwind what Erdogan and Putin agreed between each other, but I suspect that in a period of maybe 12, 18 months, that Turkey effectively turns its back on the EU, turns its back on the West, and moves eastwards. In other words, <coughs> links up with, and probably has been offered a seat on the SCO. So you then link Turkey into the whole of the SCO BRICS. Um, uh, combine. That's big. It's a big, big change. And I think the biggest change that has happened recently is Zeb Brzezinski has totally changed his attitude towards what America should be doing. Yeah, well, this is, this is interesting because you've spoken about this before. And yeah, before. I mean, in, 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 in his grand chessboard written in 1987, he effectively said, any one or more countries that are going to take control of Central Asia, we have to stop them. In his latest interview in the American Interest, the magazine, in, in April, he actually wrote and said that given the changing circumstances in the world, we have, to end, we have to forge relationships with Russia and China 
in order to uh, achieve uh, a successful result in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. But that, in turn, causes internal problems within government because you have other neoconservatives who are still saying the opposite. Right. But, what, you know, but explain for the people that don't know Brzezinski, explain why that, that book was so important when it was written. He has been a uh, foreign policy advisor to successive presidents. Um, that book was really the foundation for the neoconservatives' foreign policy, which is why it was so important. Yeah. And now he's the master of it, is changing his views. And how, I mean, how does that fit in with... There's obviously there's some real upheaval in U.S. politics right now. Is this a part of that, or is is the upheaval we're seeing at sort of street facing level a representation of bigger upheaval behind the scenes where the guys like Brzezinski kind of swim around? I, I think it's uh, bigger upheaval behind the scenes. Who is actually going to influence foreign policy, depending on who gets into the White House? And well, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna bother. I'm not even gonna bother asking you that question because it's just I mean, why? It's 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 not I don't think anybody wins in this situation. But but let's get back to China. Um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time regularly going and meeting with industrials and talking to, you know, chief financial officers and guys that make the decisions. Talk a little bit about what you found your on your most recent trip to China. I think the most important point what's going on in China now uh, is the politics. You have effectively war between the Chinese Youth League, which is currently led by Premier Li, and in the previous government by President Hu, versus the President Xi's clique, why it is so important is that the power base of the Chinese Youth League is in the provinces and local governments. So therefore, any policy that originates out of Beijing that impacts the provinces and local governments just gets put on the black burner. Right. Hence, no reform. Contrary to what people are saying, she is actually a reformer. And it had been hoped that by now he would have achieved sufficient authority that he would be able to push Premier Li upstairs to be chairman of the NPC and bring in somebody in the leadership who is a known reformer and a doer. However, ex-president Hugh apparently has muddied the waters, so the battle is still ongoing. And this is, this is what is, is causing the downdraft in China's economy. On the other hand, there are the positives. Um, First of all, which people are not talking about, restructuring is taking place, and pretty firmly, um, is taking place through the credit markets. I'll give you one example that I know personally. A major company in a particular sector is having a very bad time because many of its customers in Beijing and in the provinces have gone bankrupt, leaving them with a load of debt. The banks are supporting that company because if they didn't, then the chain reaction right. would be horrendous. So you multiply that one example by 10, 20, 30,000 times, and that tells you what's going on. So what it tells me is actually the government knows what it is doing. You can't just take a, a, a knife to this or chop to this. 
You have to do it in a step-by-step basis. Otherwise, the whole economy would implode and the impact on the rest of the world would probably be worse than in China. What we're starting to see is actually business activity is, in, is improving. You look at the PMIs compared to the start of the year, some of the other indicators that I look at, they're recovering. Industrial profits are, are recovering, which implies that you will start seeing an improvement in the investment, particularly when the political situation stabilizes. Um, I mean, it was clear to us way, way back, I can't remember, in 2007 perhaps, when we started talking about, for demographic reasons, China's growth was going from 10 odd percent down to 4%. It's still, still there, it's still on target. Mm-hmm. But you look at the size of the economy and a five, four, five percent growth in China gives you a huge lift in GDP. Was it enough? I mean, is it enough? Yeah, it's enough. I mean, it, it's, 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 but, it, but it's because the problem is not necessarily is it enough for China. The problem now becomes is it enough for all the people who've invested in the promise of 7% to not pull their money out at 4%? That, that becomes that, the issue to me. They deserve to get into trouble, and they will. And, and I mean, I've just been with a shipping guy. And he was saying, you know, China looked at what they had in their shipbuilding capacity and they've thought it through and they've now cut 40% of that capacity. They've shut it down. On the steel side, when steel prices started rising in the spring, The steel companies who had shut down or had shut down some pot lines went to their banks and say, give us the credit so they can restart. The bank said no. So it's happening. It's happening through the credit markets and it's happening through government policy. But but these are highly sensitive areas that employ an awful lot of people. Yeah, but they're still doing it. But, but how do you... Because, because um, I can't remember the numbers, but there's been a huge change in the age structure of the steel labor force. Right. They got rid of the old guys. You've got a young labor force. The young labor force today can go and get jobs anywhere. Um, unemployment is virtually non-existent. Very low. You have, in many places, you have employment shortages. But I still, I still I struggle to reconcile because you know, there, there are things that China has to do and there are things that, there are, that it's very dangerous for them to do. And this idea that they will let people go bankrupt is something that we've spoken about before. You, know, you, you believe that they will do that. Well, they're doing it. Right. They're doing it. But, but if they're supporting these these local government entities to keep that chain going, doing it a step at a time. Like where, do you, where do you allow the first one to fail? Well, they've allowed it at the top end of the chain. So it's a step by step. This is probably going to take three or five years. But, but you, don't, I mean, look, you, don't, you don't always get three or five years. That, that's the problem because the, the, the number of non-performing loans is significant. Uh, and that's the data. But they know that. that. No, no, that's but, a no, but, it's a known fact. But so do investors. And, and that's generally the the problem here is if you don't have outside capital it's fine if you're if you're an authoritarian government you do what you do you can marshal your local forces your local investors it doesn't actually make so much difference but once you let outside capital in that runs on normal or what used to be capitalist system you run the risk of scaring the horses and that becomes a problem you can't control no matter what you try I, I, I think I'm, I'm guessing now but I would guess that before you allow the foreign capital in in size, they will sort the banks out. That's a big, I mean, sorting those banks out, that's a big issue. It's a big, oh, it's big. Issue. But you don't do it all in one fell swoop. You, you, they could, they've got the resources to do it. I mean, from what I hear, the NPLs in the top 
four banks, it's 10%. The rest is around 20%. But we're seeing, you know, again, this, this, this $3 trillion of reserves that China has, it's this fabled number that we've seen slowly starting to decline. Uh, you know, and Carl, Carl Bass makes a very eloquent argument that, you know, that doesn't last very long because you don't wait till the last of those $3 trillion goes out the door before you start making plans. Once the trend is clear and you get to certain levels, you take the NPLs, you take all these things that they want to do and suddenly that money's gone. And, and you know, my concern is it, it's not, no one's going to wait for it to happen. They're going to move when they see a chance of it happening, they'll move ahead of it, and it just That's feeds what, on itself. What, what I'm saying is, uh, I don't know, but I'm sure that they actually do have a plan. Oh, I'm, no, I'm sure. But you know, Mike Tyson, the old philosopher Mike Tyson, everyone having a plan until yeah. they get punched in the face. But I think that, that that plan is more likely to be to be brought in once you have solved the political battle. Yeah, well, it yeah, all comes yeah, back sure. to the political battle. Sure, but what about? I mean, what about what about uh, the political battle in Europe? I mean, what are you seeing when you talk to people in Asia about Europe? Because obviously, it's the biggest marketplace. What do they make of what's going on in Europe? Confusion. <laughs> yeah, not confusion. <laughs> confusion. No, I said confusion. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. My bet is that Russia and China are backstopping the euro. It's a big market for them. It's political too. I would guess that for a certain large big bank that is reportedly in trouble, they're backstopping it. Um, depending on how Hinkley Point is finessed. I think that China will be supporting uh, Sterling. Um, I see many countries in Europe step by step moving away from America's domination. But to, towards what? Because they, you know, they need a benevolent. They, they, where, where's the future business? It's eastwards, not no, westwards. Sure, sure. So that's where it's going to go. But, but are they, are they really going to tie, tie their colours to a Russia-China axis? Uh, whether it's entirely tying colours um, depends on what happens in America. Right. But certainly, there's going to be a much more balanced relationship. Uh, probably over Mrs. Merkel's dead body. Yeah. Figuratively speaking. Well, let's, let's hope so. But you know, the other thing that you've written about in the past is the idea of the uh, Shanghai oil trading platform. Where, where are we with that now? Well, the trading platform is operating. It comes back to geopolitics. It comes back to Saudi Arabia. Is Saudi Arabia actually going to unpeg its currency to the dollar. As soon as that happens, then China will make payment for its oil from Saudi Arabia in RMB and open up China's financial markets uh, to Saudi, which will then immediately spill over into other Gulf countries. Um, my guess is that Russia is engineering an OPEC Mark II, of which it will be the dominant player, um, which effectively means that Saudi has to do what it's told. Who constitutes OPEC Mark II? The existing OPEC producers, but led by Russia. Is it purely currency-based that they wrestle dominance away from the Saudis? I mean, what, what enables them to do that? Geopolitics. And this is purely the, the weakening US? Well, not, not only that. Um, I think it's the way that the politics are moving in the Middle East, which is basically away from 
the Sunnis towards the Shiites. It's um, so I'm told that Russia hacked into the Aramco Saudi computer system last year, temporarily shut down a couple of, of, of oil uh, fields. It was a dress rehearsal, a signal, we can shut you down tomorrow. So I, there's, a, I, there's a lot going on beneath the surface that I think is going to lead to a different configuration of the oil market. So how, so how do you just, let's get an update on your roadmap for this, because you've, you've been quite clear in your timelines and how long you thought a lot of this stuff will play out with regards the dollar, with regards to China, with regards oil trading, etc., etc. Where are we now? How, how do you see the next six to 12 months progressing? I think we're going to have, over the next two months, a big correction in global equity markets. Um, when it looks as though the end of the world is coming, the plunge protection team will move in, will support the American stock market. Foreign stock markets will probably have more to fall than around the 10, 12% from America. By the end of the year, stroke early next year, you'll start seeing the dollar index beginning to fall. Uh, we will see central banks throwing even more credit into the system. We will start, I think, a, a new bull market in equities. It won't last 18, 24 months, will last probably with all the due corrections, etc., <clears throat> to closer to 2019, 2020. I think that's, as I understand it, that's the master plan. So you forget deflation, that's been confined to the cemetery, and we start inflation. So you're going to see a huge takeoff in inflation. And when the pieces, the jigsaw puzzle are in place, the rug is pulled out of it and we get the big crash that we've been talking about, but it's been delayed until around that period, say 2020. And in that crisis, then the whole global financial system is restructured in which gold comes as the central asset. And that will be led by who? Uh, America. Okay. So, so the, you know, the gold situation is another thing that you, know, you and I have spoken about in the past. Um, you've visited China, you've spoken to people about the amount of gold that China has, uh, which is not, doesn't correspond to the official figures. Is that accumulation of gold still going on? And if so, sure, sure. is that just an ongoing, is there, is there a level they're looking to get to, do you think? Or? I don't know what the level is, but they've probably got over 25,000 tons now, which has been accumulated since 1987. Um, don't forget that any imports that the PLA makes don't get recorded. And where do those normally come in through, do we know, or is that complete mystery? Well, I don't know where they come in from. Okay, so so <laughs> so uh, so, so the dollar. Let's just just get back to the dollar and finish on that because it is something that's that at the moment is at the center of everything. And as I said, you've been in the weak dollar camp yeah. with, with not many people for company for a while, but maybe a few more are starting to come your way now. What's your what's your roadmap for the dollar in terms of timelines now? I think the dollar starts a significant fall sometime in the next 12 months. I think the fall starts, I think, by the end of this year, early next year. Um, but there's going to be a moment when it starts a very big fall, which is the secular fall, which is going to take the dollar index down very substantially, very, very substantially. I mean, are we going back to 70? Are we going below there? I mean, what, what do you... Below what do you, that. You think we're going below there? 
and and that by by around 2023 yeah and so the knock-ons from that stronger commodities stronger emerging markets that's that's where you see the the money moving yeah well as always we'll see how this whole thing plays out but it's sure. it's all you know i love sitting and talking to you i love getting your views on these things you 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 think of things and see them in a way that not many other people do and for me that's incredibly useful in trying to figure out what the hell i think about all this stuff so you know thanks so much for coming and pleasure. chatting to me pleasure Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.